Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, once again, it's good to have everybody back, and uh, they've had their coffee break, and for those of you out in television, again, we're just an informal Bible study, and I always have to remind myself to tell you how we appreciate your letters, your prayers, your financial help, because we couldn't do what we're doing without it. And uh, we just know that the Lord is blessing it because of the response from our mail and our phone calls. Uh, whenever I got any of the office gals, I always just remind people, if you don't believe me, just ask them, <laughs> because they hear it all day long. All right, now, my little wife, again, bless her heart, wants me to remind our listening audience of this one and only book we've ever published. It's 88 Questions and Answers. But you know, in the last week, I don't know how many people have told me in their phone conversation they use these books as a mission tool. They'll keep eight or ten copies in the car. You hear it too, Melissa? And they keep eight or ten copies in their car, and whenever someone shows a smidgen of interest, they give them one. And I said, man, that's even better than Iris and I do. We haven't done that yet, and I think we're going to have to start doing the same thing. You just carry a bunch of these along and just hand them out. And uh, I think some people order 20 at a time, don't they, Melissa? Yep. So uh, it's a tremendous tool because it's, uh, in plain language, it's not real hard stuff to understand, and uh, it does get the message across. All right, we're going to move right on in to where we left off in our last program, and we're just connecting the dots. This is more or less an overview. This isn't a verse by verse. But uh, we just want folks to get an understanding how God has been dealing with the human race for the last 6,000 years. And now we feel we're close to the end. We don't know how close. It could be today. It could be another 100 years. We don't know. Because I've learned that God is eternal. Time doesn't mean anything to God, and His wheels grind slowly. But surely, as I've stressed lately, Anything that Scripture says is going to happen, it's going to happen. You rest assured. All right, so let's just jump in now then at Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost has now come. Now, before we go any further, let's go back, honey, to Leviticus. Because I think too many of our theologians who put the birthday of the church in Acts chapter 2, and for the life of me, I cannot understand why, because if you come back to Leviticus chapter 23, I think it is, yeah, Leviticus chapter 23, we have the seven feasts of Jehovah for the nation of Israel, seven of them, beginning with Passover. And uh, we're going to just drop down and read from verse 15 on to show you how clearly and specifically this day of Pentecost started at the very onset of Israel's religious experience. The seven feast days. Earlier in the chapter, we've got the feast of Passover, unleavened bread, and now when you come down to verse 10, I mean verse 15 in chapter 23. All got it? And you shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths, or seven weeks, 49 days, shall be complete. But it doesn't stop at the 49th day. You go to verse 16, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number how many days? 50. What does Pentecost mean? Pente in Latin means 50. See? So Pentecost was the feast of the 50th day. Clear enough? All right, let's just read on. 
Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath, you shall number fifty days, and you shall offer a new meal offering unto the Lord. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of the tenth deals. You shall be one, one shall be of flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. All right, now this is, go back to Acts chapter 2 then. This is the Feast of Pentecost, the fiftieth day after the Feast of Passover. And so that's why when the Lord was with the twelve, or the eleven, for forty days, there was yet ten days till Pentecost. And so in these ten days that we talked about in the last program then, between the fortieth and the fiftieth, is when Peter had Matthias fill that twelfth slot. And uh, again, just to show you that I was not remiss in saying there are a lot of people that think, Peter was remiss and should have waited for Paul at break time. One of our listeners just came up and said, yeah, somebody had just told him that in a Sunday school class the other day, that Peter was in a hurry. He should have waited for Paul. But Paul would never fit the requirements as we saw last program. It had to be a believer that was from John the Baptist until the resurrection. And Paul doesn't become a believer until years later. All right, now then, as I come into this Feast of Pentecost, this chapter 2, and yes, it is the time when the Holy Spirit will come down, but there is not one word of Gentile language in these early chapters of the book of Acts. Not one word. It's all Jewish. It's just an extension of Christ's earthly ministry. The only difference is now that with the Holy Spirit coming down, these 12 men are going to be empowered with the power from on high to carry on the very miracles and signs and wonders that Jesus did. But for what purpose? The same purpose, to prove that the one who had died and been raised from the dead and gone to glory was coming back and would still fulfill all those Old Testament promises. Now, isn't that simple? Is that so hard to understand? The only thing that interrupted the whole thing was that which had to happen for the sake of the whole human race. Christ had to die. It had to happen. He had to be buried three days and three nights. And he had to be raised from the dead. Otherwise, everything would have fallen apart. But you see, with God, things don't fall apart. In the human understanding, it may seem like it has, but it doesn't. All right, so here we are now, right according to God's eternal purposes. The day of Pentecost has arrived, and the Holy Spirit is going to come down. All right, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, did, what did I say the last program? that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son. Well, what does all this mean? God's timetable is never a day late or a day early. It's always on schedule because he's God, see? All right, so the same language. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, it wasn't the day early, it wasn't the day late, on the exact day, see? They were all with one accord in one place. That is, these 120 Jewish believers that you saw back in verse 1. You've got to remember who we're dealing with. That's all there were. After three years of signs and wonders and miracles, 120 believers in the area of Jerusalem. All right, and so they're all in one place. <clears throat> now verse 2. Suddenly, miraculously, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it, this rushing wind, filled all the house or the building with a room, wherever they were, where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like fire. Now there's the key word. If it had been fire, it would have singed their hair. But it didn't. But it was just two little tongues that appeared as fire resting on their heads. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all these, I'm assuming now the whole 120. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages is a better word than tongues. 
They were all filled with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, the reason I'm using languages, I'm going to show you now in just a couple of verses. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. See? No Gentile in that word. Jews. But ever since the Babylonian captivity, 600 years before, what had happened to the Jews of that day and time? Scattered. Thank you, Teresa. Scattered throughout the whole then known world. Just like they did more again after 70 A.D. After they had gone out into Babylon, instead of coming back to Jerusalem, like a few of them did, most of them had already scattered and had set up businesses and trades and everything all over the Roman Empire. But they were still devout Jews. Now, if they were devout Jews, what would they do? They would come back to Jerusalem for at least two of these seven feast days. They'd make more if they could, but a minimum was two. All right, so now then you have thousands upon thousands of Jews flocking into Jerusalem from all over that then-known ancient world, which, of course, would be North Africa, the Middle East, and out into the Babylonian area, as we know now, Iraq and Iran and Syria, and then all along the Mediterranean on the north side to Turkey and Greece and Rome. See, that was all the civilized world at that time. And uh, they could make arrangements to travel. And here they came for these feast days around the temple complex in Jerusalem. But they're Jews, see? All right, they were devout men. Otherwise, they wouldn't take the time and spend the money to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All right? And they came from every nation under heaven. But they were Jews. Now, remember... 600 years is a long time. How many grand, grand, grand do we now deal with over generations? All right, now these great, great, great grandkids are no longer speaking the home tongue of Hebrew. They're speaking in the language of where they're living, whether it was Rome or Athens or Babylon or Egypt. Naturally, they had picked up the language of the land in which they live. It's no different today. My goodness, when people migrate into a foreign country, ordinarily, what's the first thing they do? Learn the language. See, that's why I'm upset with our situation today. My grandparents, I can remember them talking about it. What was one of the toughest things of coming through Ellis Island over there in New York? Language. And how people would make fools of them because they didn't know what they were talking about. I don't even dare tell you what some of the things they went through, but language. But what was the first thing they did? They learned English. So when I come along, my grandparents were still speaking German, of course, but their kids and their kids' kids were now speaking English. It was the same way here. So these Jews had been out of the Hebrew environment for so long that now they were at the fourth or fifth generation removed and they were speaking the language of their homeland. So what are they going to have to have? A common language. Oh, it's, that's the miracle of Pentecost. Okay, read on. Verse 6. So when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded. They were amazed, astonished, because every man heard them, these 12 men, speak in their own, what? Language. So Jews from G Egypt were hearing the 12 in the Egyptian language. If they were from North Africa, they were hearing it in that language. If they were from Babylon, they were hearing it in Chaldean. And so was the whole crowd of Pentecost. Every Jew from wherever they'd come were miraculously hearing the twelve speak in their own language. That's what the book says. That's not my idea. It's what the book says. And why can't people believe it? You ought to read what some of these commentators say. That this is the beginning of the tongues movement. Are you kidding? 
No, this was language, see? All right, verse 7. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these who speak, the twelve now remember, are they not all Galileans? Now you see, the average Bible reader doesn't catch what's going on. Jerusalem was the elite. They were the educated. That's where all the priests and the rabbis originated. What was Galilee? Well, that was the frontier. There they were rough, and, and they were uneducated. And my goodness, these uneducated men speaking 8, 10, 12 languages? Now, I'll never forget the first guy. Do you remember Eli when we first went to Israel? That fellow could speak fluently seven languages. That just blew my mind to have that level of intelligence to be able to have a busload of Americans today and tomorrow a bunch of Japanese come in and he says, no, I don't have any more trouble with the Japanese than I do with you. Or he says, a, bring, a bunch can come over from France. He could speak French. or uh, Seven languages. Well, it was the same way here. These uneducated fishermen speaking all these languages, what's going on? Now, that's easy to understand, isn't it? They were just as human as we are. That was the miracle of Pentecost, see? And they've twisted it all out of shape. All right, now verse 8, it's repeated. How do we hear every man in our own language. See? Wherein we were born, where we were raised. And then he lists them, Parthians and the Medes and the Elamites and all these areas of the then known world. And so, verse 11, it's repeated again. Cretes, Arabians, we hear them, the twelve, speak in our language the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, what meaneth this? Well, God had them exactly where he wanted them. They were thinking. See, and that's all I ask people when I teach. Think. Just stop and think. What is God trying to tell us? It's not that hard, but you've got to put a little effort into it. All right, so now then they come up with all their crazy ideas, but Peter has to stand up and he says, no, 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 you're crazy. They're, they're not drunk. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. But what you're seeing is what the prophet Joel spoke about several hundred years before Christ, prophetically. Now, Peter goes right down the line and quotes from Joel, I think it's chapter 3, word for word, and it's prophecy. And it was all, in their view, coming right down the pipe. Now I think we got the timeline back on the board. Here we go. See, we've come out of the Old Testament with all these prophetic utterances concerning things to come. And in there, in veiled language that nobody really could comprehend, was, of course, the crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection, the ascension back to glory, as we've already seen. Zechariah said that he would return. Well, he couldn't return if he hadn't left, right? And so that was all back here in more or less veiled language. And then after his ascension, after a little period of time, they didn't know how long in would come those final seven years, which would trigger the second coming, as we've already saw in the last half hour, and he would return to Jerusalem, he would set up his throne room, and in would come the kingdom. Now, throughout all of this timeline, there was nothing revealed of this until we get to the Apostle Paul. Nothing, nothing of the age of grace. It's all based on Israel's prophecies. Now, verse came to mind and I lost it. It went in and it went out. So I'll have to come back to it later. But anyway, now at the day of Pentecost, all they can think about is the tribulation is coming. They knew that, but it would be followed by the second coming. Now that, the, oh, I knew what it was. Come back with me to Peter. I have to look, whether it's first or second. I think it's first Peter. 
when I just made the statement that these Old Testament prophets had no idea of the things that were coming except that there was something. Yeah, 1 Peter chapter 1, honey. I think I got time. I'm going to take a few more verses than I would otherwise. Come back to 1 Peter chapter 1. Might as well start verse 1 first because I always want people to understand my rule of thumb. Who's writing? The Apostle Peter. Who is he writing to? Jews, not Gentiles. All right? Chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm going to put in the word writing just for sake of understanding. Writing, because that's what he's doing. He's writing. He's not speaking. He's writing to whom? Strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. Were Gentiles scattered? No. Who was? Jews. All right, have I made my point? So the apostle of the nation of Israel is writing to his fellow Jews. All right, now come down to verse 7. That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. What's Peter talking about? Here we are. We're right in here. And Peter is writing to fellow Jews that with this horror of horrors out in front of them, they would be able to come through the testing, which would be like fire, and they would then visibly witness the second coming of Christ. But what did I tell you? They expected it within their lifetime. See? That's not so hard to understand, is it? Read it again. That the trial or the testing of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perishes. Now, you know, I made the point in one of my seminars the other day. What's the one most important thing that God is looking for from a lost human being? Not his works. His what? His faith. See? That's all God is looking for. Can you believe me? All right, here it is. That their faith might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing they've already gone through the fires of... Now, another verse comes to mind. Can't help this. Hun Come back to Zechariah. Next to the last book in our Old Testament. I think this is the exact parallel that Peter was referring to. Zechariah chapter 13, verse 8. Zechariah, next to the last book in your Old Testament, chapter 13, verse 8. And compare this with what Peter is just saying. All got it? Verse 8. And it shall come to pass. My goodness. What did I just say about a statement like that? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. We don't know when, but I'll guarantee you it's going to happen. All right, what is? That in all the land that is of Israel, saith the Lord, now watch this carefully. Two parts therein, or two-thirds, shall be cut off and die. But the third part shall be left therein. They're going to survive. They're going to make it to the end. Now verse 9. God says, I will, there's the promise, I will bring the third part through the fire, the testing of the tribulation. Listen, 
No human being on earth understands what that seven years is going to be like. We can no more comprehend that than we can the glory of heaven. But it's going to be awful. All right, but one third of Israel is going to survive. All right, I will bring the third part through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. See the connection? And I will try or test them as gold is tested. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people. And they shall say, the Lord is my God. Now again, to get the time element, here we are. Peter is talking to them. But the one-third are going to come out, and they're going to be right here at the end, and they're going to soon witness the second coming of their Messiah. All right, back to 1 Peter. Back to 1 Peter. Now verse 8. Whom, having not seen, you love. In other words, a lot of these believing Jews that Peter was addressing had already come in as believers, never having really witnessed anything of his earthly ministry. <clears throat> whom though now you see him not, yet believing, in other words, with your faith, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now verse 10. Here's what I come back here for. Of which salvation? This salvation now based, of course, on who Jesus of Nazareth really was. Of which salvation the prophets, the Old Testament writers, have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you at some future day. Now verse 11, back to the prophets again, who were searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who within them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. All right, now in the 20 seconds I got left, what's that telling us? The Old Testament prophets knew this was coming, but they couldn't get the picture. They just couldn't understand how God would fulfill all these things. But he was back there, and see, now, you and I, with our New Testament, we can understand. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures, and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.